morning. morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the subject of preterism and spiritual gifts. Now, you might ask, how are these connected? Okay, how are they connected? How is preterism connected to your spiritual gift? Well, I believe that only if you understand preterism can you correctly understand the spiritual gifts. Now, preterism is, is an eschatology. It's a theological view of the end times. But to understand preterism, you have to have an understanding of hermeneutics, particularly audience relevance. In order to properly understand the spiritual gifts, you have to know what time it is. All right, if you don't know what time it is, you're not going to understand a lot about the gifts. You're going to be confused. And by that, I mean that you need to understand that we are not living in what the Bible calls this age. This age ended over 2,000 years ago, and when this age ended, so did the spiritual gifts. All right, so let's look at what the Bible has to say about spiritual gifts. Look with me at what Paul writes in Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 7, he says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now, you may not see, in just reading this verse, <laughs> you probably don't at all, <laughs> but the uniform interpretation of this verse is that Christ has given spiritual gifts to different believers. And you say, oh, how does it say that? Well, this verse doesn't really say that. This meaning has to be imported from the parallel passage of 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and the immediate context of verse 11 that says, and he gave the apostles and prophets, the evangelists and shepherds and teachers. These are gifts given to the first century church for the purpose of ministering to the body of Christ. Now, verse 7, he says, grace was given. The word grace here in our text is from the Greek word charis, which is an abstract noun, and it's very general. But when the abstract noun has an article, as it does here, a particular aspect of the noun is stressed. In this context, it's referring to an, an enablement given to each believer to empower them for ministry. It's very closely connected with charisma, which is a grace gift. And Paul uses these two terms side by side in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 1, 7, and in 12, 6. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. Now, the Greek word here for gift is charisma, which means gift of grace, and the word grace is haras. So we see that Paul uses Hadisma as a particular manifestation of Yahweh's enabling grace. So I think that we can conclude that Ephesians 4.7 is talking about spiritual gifts. Paul's not referring to the grace that, you know, saves us, but to the grace that equips each believer for service and ministry. Now, what exactly is a spiritual gift? That'd be a good place to start so we can define this so we know what we're talking about. And I imagine if you ask different people, you're going to get different responses. What is a spiritual gift, right? Let me give you my definition. A spiritual gift is a God-given capacity through which the Holy Spirit supernaturally ministers to the body of Christ. Now, note the supernaturally there, okay? All right. I get this from what Paul says about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. He says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, manifestation here, phanerosis is the Greek word. It has the basic idea of making known, clear, or evident. And this is what a spiritual gift is. It's a manifestation of the Spirit. It's not your normal natural abilities, it is a supernatural function. Now, John MacArthur defines spiritual gift as, let me just say this up front, I agree with him on this, okay? Because I normally quote MacArthur, and I'm not agreeing with him. I want you to understand, I, I do agree with him here. And so, see, sometimes I quote him when I agree with him, all right? 
He defines spiritual gift as God-given channels in the believer sovereignly designed for every Christian through which the Holy Spirit ministers to the building up of the church. S. Lewis Johnson gives this definition. Spiritual gifts are divine abilities for Christian service. Now, I agree with these men on the definition of spiritual gifts. All right, so keep in mind that spiritual gifts are supernatural. They're channels through which the Spirit ministers. They're divine abilities. So they're not natural. They're supernatural. And they are manifestations of the Spirit. Now, some people have athletic ability. Some have ability to paint or draw. They're very artistic. Artistic. Others have musical ability. Others excel in various functions in life. Those abilities are given to people all over the world whether they are believers or not, all right? I think we all realize some people have other talents that we don't have. They have different abilities. It's like the rain. You know, these abilities come upon the just and the unjust alike. But spiritual gifts were given only to Christians. And that was something they never had before they were a Christian. All right, there's there's three sections, basically, in Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul notes examples of 13 of the gifts. In verses 8 through 10, he mentions nine of them. Let's look at these sections together. He says, For to one is given through the Spirit utterance of wisdom. Often this is called words of wisdom. And another, the utterance of knowledge. And to another, the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy to know the ability to distinguish between spirits. That's often called the gift of discernment. To other various kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues. So Paul lists these different gifts here. And then you drop down to verse 28 and 29, he adds four more of them. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, then prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, Various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? The answer to that is no. All right. Then in Romans 12, Paul lists five more additional gifts. He lists service, exhortation, contributes. Now, that is um, giving, often called the gift of giving. All right. The one who contributes, the one in generosity, the one who leads with zeal and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So he adds these different gifts. Then in Ephesians 4, we have two more listed. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and shepherds and teachers. Now, so he adds these these two gifts here, evangelist and shepherd teacher. Now, these two words are linked by a single definite article, and this suggests that either Paul has only one group of ministers in mind, or it's an overlapping function, and this is often hyphenated, pastor-teacher, like it's one thing, all right? All right, taking all the references to the spiritual gifts, we get a grand total of 20 gifts listed in Scripture. There they are. Can you read that? There they are. All right, so we got these 20 different gifts, and the purpose of them all is for building up the body of Christ. All right, Ephesians 4.12 to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now, the purpose of these gifted men, now these gifts was to equip the saints so that they would do the work of the ministry. They would use their spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ. Now, what happens when the body of Christ is complete? When the body of Christ has been built up and the building is finished, Do we still need the gifts then, if their purpose is for building the body? I think when the body of Christ reached maturity, the gifts ended. And we'll talk about that a little more. But there's a lot of question about how many gifts there are. And I said, I got 20 listed here in Scripture. Should we restrict the gifts only to those listed in Scripture? Okay, yeah, I like that answer. Because if we don't, then what? You make up anything you want. 
If it's not in the Bible, you just make up anything you want. And C. Peter Wagner does just that. He opts for what he calls an open-ended approach, and he writes this. I do not doubt that there are even more than 27 of them. I don't know where he gets the extra seven. I have no clue. But he says this. Some might want to add the gift of music. So that's a spiritual gift. Hmm, it's interesting, isn't it? The gift of music. And he, said, he says, and make it 28. Or craftsmanship. And make it 29. He says, I ran into another gift recently, which might be called the gift of names. Now, by that he means someone who remembers people's names. So that's a spiritual gift now. You have this God-given ability to remember somebody's name. You could also write it down. That would help. Okay? But my question here is, where does it end? I mean, we just, anything someone does, we think it's a spiritual gift. I mean, maybe Gary, Garrett and I have the gift of sarcasm. Is that a spiritual gift? <laughs> Or maybe my wife has the gift of baby holding, or baby hogging, as we say, all right? You know, you just go on and on. Where would you end with this? Where does it stop? Well, I think, as we said earlier, I think it should stop where Scripture stops. Scripture lists 20 of them. Let's, let's hold on to those 20. Let's don't keep, you know, making up stuff. Let's keep our emphasis on the Word of God not on the individual. The Word of God has to be the sole court of appeals. And again, if you go outside the Word, then you're just it's your speculation, and you can make up anything you want to. Spiritual gifts were not natural abilities. They weren't talents. Natural abilities and talents are shared by believer and unbeliever alike. An unbeliever can be a great musician. I mean, Jeff plays the drums well, right? <laughs> Some of you got that, all right. <laughs> no, an, an unbeliever can be great at a lot of things. They can have a good memory for names and not even be a Christian. They can be an excellent teacher. When you're going through school, did you have some teachers that you felt like actually taught and others who you're like, I don't even know what they're saying. I don't know what they're doing. You know, if you get a lousy teacher, it's because they're really not a teacher. They don't have the ability to teach, and so you just leave there confused. These are unsafe people. Have you ever seen the tests that they give for spiritual gifts? A lot of churches, they have a test. Here's a test. Take the test. Tell you where your spiritual gift is. Well, if you're a teacher and you're good at that, you, you're just going to say, you're a teacher. You have the gift of teaching. And you're like, that's interesting, because I'm not even a Christian, but I have a spiritual gift of teaching. Spiritual gifts only come as a result of salvation. They were supernatural enablements given by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of ministry. Now, there's basically three positions today in the church on spiritual gifts, and I've held all three of these positions, okay? The first position is all the gifts are for all believers, all right? This is basically the Pentecostal charismatic position. And at one point in my Christian life, I was charismatic, and I believed that all gifts were for everybody. All right? Secondly, some of the gifts have been removed. I held this position at one time. All right? They believe that the miraculous ones have been removed, and the other gifts are for all believers. They're still around today. This would be a, a Baptist or a Reformed position. All right? So they believe some of them are around, some of them are not around. And then thirdly, there's this position that I now hold. All the gifts have been removed. There are no spiritual gifts today. And this view is held by most preterists. Now, I say most because you understand that someone believes the Lord returned in AD 70 doesn't mean they agree with you on anything else, okay? I mean, they might not agree with you on anything else. And I've been... I spoke at a conference once, and I had a lady come up to me, and she said, you know, she was a preterist, but she said, how can you say the gifts are done? And I'm like, I think they are. She goes, how do people get saved if we don't have evangelists? And I'm like, well, from you sharing the gospel. You know, we don't need evangelists for people to get saved. I mean, her idea was unless you had a spiritual gift, you can't, you know, no, you just take the gospel and you share with people, and if God has called them, they'll become Christians. So I, most, 
most preterists hold this. There are preterists who are charismatic, and they still believe all the gifts are available today. So, Now, the issue of whether or not all the spiritual gifts are for today has caused a lot of debate and a lot of strife in the body of Christ. All right? There are some groups who say that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian. You don't have the spirit, and you're not a Christian. There are other groups that say, if you do speak in tongues, you're demonically possessed, okay? And, and you know, you're not a Christian. So, I mean, these, you got this on both sides, all right? So, let's talk first about the Pentecostal charismatic position, that all the gifts are operative today. Their view is if it happened in the New Testament, it should be happening in the church today. And the reason they say that is because they don't know what time it is. All right? Are miracles the norm of Christianity? No? You don't think they're the norm? One Pentecostal writes this, The responsibility of the church to serve others did not end in AD 70. No problem there. He says, nor did its responsibility to reach others. No problem there. Then he says, a Pentecostal church ought to manifest the supernatural. Hmm. What's he mean by that? Many years ago, when we were on vacation, we visited a church. And in the message, the pastor said, the Bible is a book of miracles from beginning to end. Therefore, we should expect miracles. Is that right? Should the church today manifest the supernatural? I mean, should we be expecting the miraculous? No. Miracles are not the norm. They're not indiscriminately strewn through every page of Scripture. But let me just say here that I would agree with their view of the supernatural as manifest if they're talking about love. Because I think that biblical love is supernatural. Yeshua said, love your enemies. That's miraculous when you do that, okay? That's, that's supernatural, because that's not your innate ability to be able to do that. It's not natural, it's supernatural. And th I think the church should be manifesting the supernatural in really loving our enemies, loving the unlovely. Now, a study of biblical history will show that there's basically only three periods in biblical history where miracles occurred. There are large periods of history without any recorded miracles at all. People say, oh, the Bible's just full of it. That's not true. There's no miracles clustered around Abraham or David. John the baptizer did no miracle, even though Yeshua said, I tell you among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So we find miracles grouped in three great periods in history. Moses and Joshua... Elijah and Elisha, Christ and the Apostles. And there's gaps of hundreds of years between these periods where there's no miracles. The introduction of new revelation brought the need for miracles to authenticate the message and the messengers. Miracles were God's testimony that those bringing the new revelation were His official representatives. Moses introduced the law to the newly formed nation of Israel. And miracles were given to introduce this error and to codify these new revelations to Israel. And then Elijah and Elisha, they were God's special prophets for a day of decadence in Israel's history. The worship of Baal had reached its peak, and Elijah and Elisha stood for the revival of the prophetic error in an age of critical spiritual decline. Miracles such as Mount Carmel were given by God to draw Israel back to the institution of prophecy. Can you imagine being there on Mount Carmel when this took place? You guys, and he's laying there taunting them. Maybe you got sleeping. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Go wake him up. Come on, you guys. They're all cutting themselves. I don't think I'd be wanting to taunt someone's got a knife and, you know, cutting themselves. And then he just says, God, show them who's God. And the fire comes down and people kill the prophets of Baal. Yahweh became a man. So in Christ and the apostles, obviously there's some proof that we need to substantiate that claim. And the New Testament hangs on Christ and the apostles. Thus in the life of Christ and the apostles, miracles heralded the new revelation. Look at John 3, 2. It says, This man came to Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from, come from God. How did they know that? 
How do they know he's from God? He says, for no one can do the signs, the miracles, the miracles that you do unless God is with them. Obviously, God's with you just by the things you're doing. And then in John 14, 11, Yeshua said, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. In other words, you've seen me do these miraculous things. That should show you who I am. By his miracles, Christ informed the disciples who he was and the power he possessed. Miracles through the apostles proclaim that the Almighty God was at work in the church. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. So the sign of an apostle, you know, there's people today that call themselves apostles, apostles so-and-so. And I'm like, show me the miraculous that you performed to get this title, apostle, okay? Signs and wonders and mighty works. God did this to verify his apostles. So miracles aren't the norm. They're the exception. This becomes clear as we study biblical history. So let me ask you this. Are the modern charismatic gifts the same as we see in the New Testament? They say all the gifts are for believers today. They say it's just, if, the new, if it happened in the New Testament, it should be happening today. And I question, are they? Is there, are they the same? There's a definite lack of similarity. For example, are lame men who never walked healed so they can jump and walk and praise God? You ever seen that happen? You ever been to a healing service, miracle service? I did, right after we first moved here, Ernest Angley came to the Hampton Coliseum. And so I went to see him. I mean, again, I was Pentecostal at this time, you know, and I'm like, oh, great, let's go see some miracles, you know. So we go there and walk into the Coliseum, and there's tables set up, and they're selling goods. And one of the things they're selling are 8 by 10 glossy photos of Ernest Angley in a prayer position. And so I just got a little sick to my stomach in the beginning. I'm like, what is this is nauseating, you know, what's this about? And then you get in and the service is going on and he, oh, he was an expert at taking an offering. You know, if you love God, stand up and wave a hundred dollar bill, you know. And then he, you know, he kept going down the denominations. Okay, you just love God a little bit, raise your one dollar bill, you know, and they're passing Kentucky fried chicken buckets. All right, then the healing line comes along. You ever seen Ernest Ains do healing? It is so comical, okay? You know, he'll go touch somebody, and he'll step back, and he'll go, they have the spirit, the, di the nicotine demon, you know? <laughs> Come out, thou foul. Yeah, because they smell like smoke. So. so he's going through, and he's healing people of low back pain, sinus headache, uh, you know, nebulous things that you can't. And all of a sudden, the doors open down front, because there's a little commotion up in the front, and paramedics come in with a stretcher. And there's a guy, he's right in the front. He has a heart attack. And so they're working on him, you know. Try, and I'm like, does nobody else see this? Does, is nobody in this place thinking he's got a healing line going on, healing people? Here's a guy with a heart attack. The paramedics are helping him. They put him on the stretcher. They carried him out the door. And things just went on. And I'm sitting there thinking, hmm. Something is not right here. But it's like nobody considered it. Yeah, I did too. I was like, whoa, this ain't right. Not right at all. So, you know, they're saying it's the same gifts, but you don't see it. Let me ask you, do you see missionaries blinding their opponents as Paul did? Do you think people would be a little more open to Christian missionaries if they did that? <laughs> Do preachers preach the word to foreign-speaking audience who hear what they're saying in their own language? When I was charismatic, here's what concerned me. Okay, the gift of tongues. Everybody does. you got to have the gift of tongues, okay? And I had it. Thought, thought I had it. I spoke in tongues. Could not get my wife to do it. She's like, that's nonsense. <laughs> she was smarter than me. But, uh, you know, spoke in tongues. And I'm thinking, here's all these preachers, these big Pentecostal charismatic preachers, when they go somewhere, they use an interpreter. And I'm like, okay, that again doesn't make sense. And first of all, I would not like to preach through an interpreter. Because if you don't trust this guy, you don't know this guy. You're up there saying, 
Jesus is Lord, and he's saying, this guy's a fruitcake, he has no idea what he's talking about. You know, you don't know what's going on. But, I mean, why use an interpreter if you have the gift of tongues just speaking their language? That's the purpose of the gift, right? Do church leaders discern hypocrisy among people and pronounce immediate death on them? Oh, boy. That would make an interesting service, wouldn't it? <laughs> So-and-so, let me ask you a question, you know. How about your giving this month? Ah, oh, fall down dead. No, that, that's a little bit different. How about evangelists? Do they amaze the entire city with miracles like Philip did? Are there entire multitudes healed by merely being in the shadow of a healer? No. So I think that the position that all gifts are functioning today is wrong. What happened in the early church is not happening today. Uh, there was a physician who wrote a book, A Physician in Search of a Miracle. He followed Catherine Coleman around as a genuine interest to want to know, is there any reality to this? You know, because she had healing services and people were supposedly healed. And he followed those people who were supposedly healed and found out that they weren't healed the next day. And many of the people committed suicide later because God had rejected them because they weren't healed. I mean, they maybe stood out of their wheelchair on the stage, but then they were right back in their wheelchair the next day. And so it was like, this is not good, you know. So it was more harmful than good. And I think people even today flock to these people because when you are sick, you want healing, no matter how, you know. So you just hope and believe that this guy, someone can help me and I can get the healing that I want. All right, let's look at the Baptist reform position. Some of the gifts have been removed, all right? They're going to make a distinction here. They hold that some of the gifts have passed away, but some of them are still here. They, and they make a distinction with what the between what they call the permanent edifying gifts and the temporary foundational or sign gifts, all right? Now, the Bible doesn't have any text that says there's temporary gifts and permanent gifts, but scriptures do indicate that some of the gifts were temporary. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. Tongues, they will cease. All right, tongues are going to end, he's saying. As for knowledge, it's going to pass away. So this text clearly says tongues are going to cease, Prophecies will pass away, knowledge will pass away, and it doesn't mean knowledge in the sense of knowledge, it's the gift of knowledge, all right? That's what it's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe this does mean knowledge. <laughs> and there are several scriptures that hint at the fact that signs and wonders were temporary. All right, for example, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. All right, now in Hebrews 2, 3, the main verb is in the past tense, and the participle is relative in time to the main verb was attested to. So the signs, the wonders, and the miracles are referred to as being in the past at the time of the writing. All this was past at the time that Hebrews was written. Now, Hebrews was written probably 67, around that time, all right? So the voice of history confirms the temporary nature of the signs. If the miraculous signs of the New Testament age had continued in the church, we would expect an unbroken line of occurrence from apostolic times to the present. But the miraculous signs of the last days ceased when the last days ceased. Chrysostom, who was a 4th century theologian, said that the miraculous gifts had ceased so long before his time that no one was certain of their characteristics. Now those who separate the gifts between temporary and permanent break it down something like this. They separate the the temporary gifts into two categories. Foundational gifts, which would be uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, discernment, apostles. All right? And then the sign gifts would be healing, miracles, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. What they call the permanent edifying gifts will be broken down into uh, gifted men, which would be evangelist and pastor teacher, 
and then the rest of the gifts would be, these are permanent, they say, faith, teaching, helps, administration, service, exhorting, giving, ruling, mercy. So they would say that these 11 permanent edifying gifts are available today for all believers. Are these gifts still given to believers? Have some been taken away and some still there? Most believers would say yes. Most Christians, and that's why you go to a church, they'll give you a test on spiritual gifts to find out what you have so they know what to do with you, you know, how to help you help serve in the thing, in the church. Now, think with me again. This is a thinking thing. You know, if you think, you, <laughs> you get in trouble about, you know, Ernest Angley. Why aren't you healing this guy down here with a heart attack? That would be something I'd like to see. All right, no. We need to learn to think. We need to be critical thinkers. Not critical people, but critical thinkers. If spiritual gifts are manifestations of the Spirit, then when the Spirit manifests Himself, let's say in teaching, the gift of teaching, that teaching would always be true, accurate teaching and would never change. You agree with that? I mean, it's a supernatural gift, right? That makes sense. Yahweh never changes, so the Spirit's teaching would never alter. So, I, mean, I believe for many years that I had the gift of teaching, okay? So, if I had the gift of teaching, would the supernatural manifestation of the Spirit be dispensationalism? And then later, amillennialism? And then later, preterism? Like, make up your mind, Spirit. What are we doing here, okay? The Spirit never changes, okay? I keep changing. I mean, am I teaching, I'm teaching Arminianism. I thought Calvinists were lunatics. I really did. You know, that's what's amazing to me. When you think something is out there and it's crazy and then you become that, it's like God's doing something in your life, okay? I moved into Calvinism. If teaching is a manifestation of the Spirit, the person with the gift should never change what they're teaching because it's the Spirit empowering them. The Spirit is teaching them. They're not, you know all of a sudden saying, oh, well, look, let's change this. I changed my mind on this. No, it's always the same. And those in the first century were all on the same page. The prophets, the teachers, they're teaching the same thing, not the different things, not 10 million things like they're out there today. So, you know, that's why I have a problem with even these gifts that they say are still around. And let me ask you about the gift of helps. What kind of spiritual gift does it take to help set up chairs in the church? But, but I've seen that, you know. You have some people who just, they're servants. Okay, they're not selfish. They're willing to help. They're willing to do whatever. And so they come in the church and we say, you got the gift of help. And we just brand them because they're helping, you know. And the gift of giving. And you could say, I don't give because I don't have that gift. <laughs> oh... All right, let's go to the third position. The one that I hold is that all gifts have been removed. All right? I believe all the gifts passed away in AD 70. Now, let me attempt to support that position today. If we're going to correctly understand the New Testament, we have to understand what's called the transition period. And we've talked about this a lot, but this is so important. I would say that most Christians have never heard of the transition period. They have no clue of, as to what that is. It'd be strange to them. Charity, put me full screen, please. This is what most people think happened. You, you, the Bible talks about this age and the age to come. And they think, all of a sudden, we're here, and then we jumped over there. And that's what happened, right? But it's more like this. You have this age... And then at Pentecost, the church is born, the church is the blue, and the church begins to grow, and the Old Covenant is fading away during this 40-year period until you get to AD 70, and on the other side of AD 70, there's no more Old Covenant. It is gone, it is ended, it is finished. This age goes all the way through to AD 70. All right, both are occurred, the church is growing, Ah, this is called the transition period because we're in a transition. The old is fading. The new is coming in. And Ephesians says, I can't even read that from here. You are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That, that church was being built. It was growing. And the mature church was Yahweh's dwelling. And when the church did mature, God moved in. 
That's this age. There's no more Old Covenant on the other side of that AD 70. Now, during the transition period, the church is moving from infancy, when it first started at Pentecost, to maturity. Yahweh worked in the growing church through miraculous gifts, and he spoke through his prophets to the church to bring them to maturity. A spiritual house was being built for Yahweh to dwell in. That's what was happening during this time. This is a time of change. This is a time of growth. That's why when people say, if it happened in the New Testament, it should happen today. No, we're not in those times. Those were special times. All right? It was a time of transformation from Old Covenant to New Covenant. The old things of Judaism, the old things faded out very slowly, and the New Covenant gradually phased in. It was a changing. All right, wait a minute. i got to back up here. It was a changing of the ages. All right, now, all through the New Testament, we see these ages in contrast, this age and the age to come. And hopefully, if you're paying attention, you've seen that in the Scripture. All right, Charity, we can go back to split screen. Uh, Matthew 12, 32 says, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Now, most people would say that this age is is this age, the age we're living in. But no, this was written 2,000 years ago. This age and the age to come, they're different. I like the way the complete Jewish Bible puts this. All right? One can say something against the Son of Man and be forgiven. But whoever keeps on speaking against the Ruach HaKodesh will never be forgiven either in the Alam Hazeh or in the Alam Haba. Now, Jewish theology maintains that time was divided into two great periods, the Mosaic Age, the Alam Hazeh, or the Messianic Age, the Alam Hobah. The Messiah was viewed as the one who would bring in the new world. The period of the Messiah was therefore correctly characterized by the synagogue as the Alam Hobah, which means the world to come. And the word come here at the end is the Greek word mellow, which means about to be. So we could translate this, the age that was about to come in the first century. When they wrote this, it was about to come. So the writers of the New Testament saw the Alam Haba as very near. So the New Testament, again, many times speaks of the two ages, this age, the age to come. And the understanding of these ages and when they change is fundamental to interpreting the Bible. And that's why so many people think, well, this should be happening today because it happened in the Bible. Well, that was in that age. We're in the age to come now. That transition is over. And again, as we saw in this slide, they didn't change overnight. It was a fading. The age was developing and coming in. The New Testament writers lived in the age that they called this age. And when we read that now, we have to understand it's not this age. To the writers of the New Testament, the age to come was future, but it was very near. Because that age was about to end. Now, I said earlier there are three periods of miracles. The first one was Moses and Joshua. And that period of miracles lasted how long? Moses and Joshua. Anybody? How long? 40 years. 40 years. All right, that's interesting. Where do we hear that number? 40 years. Yahweh supernaturally provided for the children of Israel during the Exodus. Okay? It was a miraculous period. Look at uh, Nehemiah 9, 19 to 21. Now, try to think about being the Israelites and seeing this stuff. You and your great miracles, you and your great mercies, did not forsake them in the wilderness the pillar of cloud to lead them. So whenever they're moving, they're following this pillar. In the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. So, I mean, they have clear evidence that God is leading them. And when that cloud or pillar of fire started moving, guess what? They packed up camp and they followed it to light the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth. Every day they get up, they walk around, they pick up manna. What's manna mean? What is it? That's it. What's it? They, that's what they said. What's this? Oh, it's manna. That's manna means. What is it? They fed, God fed them every day. They had enough to live on. Forty years they ate manna, all right, from their mouth, 
and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. All right, there's this 40-year period they're being taken care of. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Forty years they're wearing the same clothes. They're seeing the miracles. God's providing water out of rocks. I mean, all these things they're seeing, all right? So for 40 years, the miracles continued, and Yahweh supernaturally provided for their every need. When did the miraculous provision of the Exodus period end? It ended when they entered the land. Joshua 5.12 says, And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. They're in the land now. They're eating the produce. They don't need the manna. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So when the Exodus period ended, so did the miraculous. At the end of 40 years, the miraculous ended. This Exodus period, as we've been saying, was a type. The same is true for the anti-type, the second Exodus period. The type is a picture, the anti-type is the reality. Now a type is a real exalted happening in history which was divinely ordained by the omniscient God to be a prophetic picture of what he proposed to bring to fruition in Yeshua. So Israel went from type to anti-type by means of a second exodus. Everyone's familiar with the first exodus, 40-year wandering. Well, Luke writes this in Luke um, 9.31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The word for departure here is the Greek word exodus. He says there's another exodus that Yeshua is about to accomplish at Jerusalem. This is another 40-year journey. This is not a physical one. This is a spiritual one. This second exodus was spoken of in the prophets. In Isaiah 11, 10 and 11, it says, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the people, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And that day... The Lord will extend His hand yet a second time to recover the remnant of the remains of His people. Another exodus. There's going to be another time He's going to bring them out. His people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. So Isaiah 11, 1 through 12, predicts the coming of Messiah's rule and the reuniting of the tribes of Israel. This was to be accomplished by another exodus. Now, when did this second exodus begin? Well, to know that, we have to know when the first exodus began. When did the first exodus begin? Passover. Passover, all right? You'll remember that the first Passover was observed when Israel was about to be delivered from Egypt. Exodus 12, 3 says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. The lamb was to be in their house for four days, then on the 14th they were to slay it. So who's the antitype of the lamb? It's the Lord Yeshua. And Passover is a type or picture of something greater. It pictured the redemption of God's elect through the sacrifice of His Son, Yeshua, Hamashiach. Now the typical significance of Passover is real clear in the New Testament writings. Probably there's no Moak institution that's a more perfect type than this. The first Passover was celebrated on the 14th of Nisan, beginning Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Then almost 2,000 years later, Yeshua the Christ is crucified on the 14th of Nisan, beginning a second exodus. So the first and second exodus, the type and the anti-type, both began on Passover, and Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan, the Exodus was a type. The Passover deliverance was not consummated until they reached the Promised Land. So the Passover began with the sacrificing of the Passover lamb, introduced in Exodus 12, while Israel's still in bondage. They ate the first Passover while they were still in Egypt. And Numbers 9, 5 says they ate it again while they were wandering in the wilderness, and then in Joshua, they enter the land. And Joshua 5, 9 and 10 says this, Yahweh said to Joshua, Today, 
40 years later, today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. 40 years later, now they're in the land, though. I've rolled away from you. And so the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. Now, throughout the history of Israel, the Passover recalled not only the sparing of the house marked with the blood of the Passover lamb, but also Israel's deliverance out of slavery from Egypt, a deliverance that was consummated 40 years later in crossing the Jordan River. Once their redemption was consummated by their being in the promised land, then were they truly redeemed from Egyptian bondage, 40 years later. And this is true of the second Exodus generation. Their redemption was not consummated until the Lord returned for his bride 40 years later after Pentecost. What event ended the first Exodus period? It was the destruction of Jericho, right? They got into the land. See, Jericho stood at the entrance of the promised land. It's this huge fortified city, and it represented a serious challenge to Israel's claim to the land. So its fall telegraphed a message to all the world that God's the Lord of his people. So what marked the end of the second Exodus period? Another city fell. This time it's Jerusalem, right? Nothing represented the old system better than the temple in Jerusalem. Here is where the presence of God dwelt. The presence assured them that they were his people. But 40 years after the cross. Now, people, is this all just happenstance? Is this all, wow, that's pretty cool how that worked out. Yeah, it's just a coincidence. You know, they, they start on the same day. They end with the same situation. Similar to the collapse of the walls of Jericho, the fall of Jerusalem symbolized the entrance of the redeemed remnant into the everlasting kingdom of God. The believers were vindicated and revealed to be the sons of God while judgment is falling on the Jewish system because they'd rejected God as their king. And believers now reside in the new Jerusalem, which the Bible calls the new covenant, is the new Jerusalem. It's the city of God. Let me share with you just some comparison. Again, some more coincidences that we find in Scripture. Comparisons between the two 40-year Exodus period. All right, these periods of miracles. The first was preceded by physical slavery, the bondage of the Hebrews in Egypt. The second was preceded by spiritual slavery, man's bondage to sin and death. One introduced the first Passover with the blood of lambs. The other fulfilled the type with the sacrifice of the final Passover lamb, Yeshua, on the exact, exact same day. All right? One brought God's people physical deliverance by crossing through the Red Sea. The other brought God's people spiritual deliverance through the cross of Christ. The first established a temporary covenant with God's people, which was the old covenant, and the second established a permanent covenant with God's people, the new covenant. Fifty-five days after the first Passover in Egypt, the law was given to the nation of Israel on Mount Sinai, written on tables of stone, and 3,000 people died. Fifty-five days after the final Passover was sacrificed, the law was given to the nation of Israel, the people of God, the Israel of God, written on hearts by the Spirit of God, and 3,000 people were saved. Now, that's just a weird coincidence, isn't it? The law is given, 3,000 die. The law comes, the new covenant comes, and 3,000 people are given life. It's strange how that worked out. You know, very few people would disagree with these points. You know, our fulfillment of the shadows given at the time of the Exodus. But the correlation doesn't stop with the initial workings of the Exodus. It continues with the entrance into the temporal land of rest 40 years later. Just as the children of faith were allowed to enter the temporal land of rest for the first time, the children of faith in the generation directly following the cross of Christ were given entrance into the eternal land of rest. With each covenant, a 40-year transition period followed the initial act of deliverance, which was filled with miracles and signs. That 40 years, they saw all kinds of miracles. All right, the same thing happened in the second Exodus. During both periods, 
They saw God work for 40 years. God manifested himself to the people by signs and wonders. In the desert under Moses' leadership, daily manna, miraculous surprise of water and meat, the appearance of a cloud and fiery pillar. And then in the transition period to the new covenant, the apostles had special gifts of healing, prophecy, tongue speaking, and testified to the coming of the kingdom of God and the destruction of the wicked. They saw all kinds of things happening during that time period that told them God was behind this movement. Now, in both Exodus periods, the miraculous stopped when the Exodus ended. Both periods. And that's why the gifts were miraculous. They're not needed once the transition period is over. Paul, in writing to the saints during the transition period, during this time, the gifts were operating, and they ended at the end of the age. And we don't have and therefore don't need spiritual gifts today, but here's what Paul writes in Ephesians. He said, and he gave the apostles and prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, all right? So there, the purpose here is to build up this body. Then he says, until... We all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature manhood, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now according to this passage the gifts were to be used to bring the church from a state of infancy to adulthood. The word translated here mature is the Greek word teleon and the purpose of spiritual gifts is to build up the body. Once the body is mature, we don't need the spiritual gifts. Now, in this passage in Ephesians, maturity is defined as the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. This happened at the second coming. The body was complete. The Lord returned for His body, indwelt the church, there's so much confusion today about spiritual gifts, but now you know why. It's because they were for the transition period. And when the transition period ended, so did the gifts. That's why so many believers have no clue as to what their gift is. And so many believers get assigned the gift of helps. So we can't think of anything else you can do. You can set up chairs, all right? That's your spiritual purpose. Well, you know, I have good news for you. You can stop wasting time trying to figure out what your spiritual gift is. You don't have one. Just get busy serving the Lord with the talents and the abilities He's given you. Now, understand this. When I say there's no spiritual gifts, I do believe God has equipped every one of us with talents and abilities to serve the body. Okay? They're not supernatural. And we just have to use what God's given us. And you look at people and you see the difference in people. You know, they have different abilities. They have different talents that they can do certain things. I took guitar lessons for two years. I can't play a note. Jeremy decides to start playing and picks up a guitar and plays like a rock star. That's an ability that God gave him. And I, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that you take someone who doesn't have that ability, you can give them all the lessons in the world. And they're not going to be able to play. They just can't do it, you know? And it's that way in so many different areas, you know? Some people, some people can't know which end of a car goes where, you know? And other people can take it apart and put it back together. Why? That's an ability they have. It's not a spiritual, there's not a mechanic spiritual gift, okay? It's just an ability. Some people can work with their hands and fix things. Others can't do that at all. We're different. But in the body of Christ, these differences are to help each other out and to grow together and to support each other. Now, let me add this here so we're clear on this. 
There's some full preterists, I believe, who push the idea of audience relevance. They push that principle that, you know, it's written to them, not to us. They push it to a hyper-application of the Bible just being history and lacking any present-day application to the believer. None of it's written to us, none of it has to do with us. It's all, you know, they push that far away. Okay, it's not for us. Let me be clear that this full preterist does not believe that the Bible is just history and lacks present-day application. I wouldn't constantly be nagging you to read the Bible if it wasn't relevant to us, okay? It's very relevant to us. I'll tell you, I mean, every day when I spend time reading, I'm encouraged, I'm strengthened, I'm motivated. But I do believe the Bible was written to a certain audience, which is not us, okay? We're not Romans to the church in Rome. No, we're not Ephesians. But listen, here's what this other group misses. We are the church. So Paul wrote to the church at Rome, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Philippi, okay? There's things happening there that don't apply to us because they're time-sensitive. Other things, Yodia and Syntyche are fighting. That has nothing to do with us. They're gone, all right? But the principles that he gives to the church, we are the church, are still applicable. So we have to understand what did it mean to the original audience how does this apply to them? And then, does this carry on in the church? Is this something he gets given to the church? So from my perspective, unless I have reason not to, I apply the principles in the New Testament to believers today. For example, I think 21st century American Christians are called to walk worthy of the Lord. All right? He well, you, people will say, no, that's not to us. Really? We're the church. I think we're to be humble. I think the Bible calls for that, okay? I don't think he just told the Philippians, you guys ought to be humble. The rest of the church, don't worry about them. They can do, they don't need to be humble. No! He's writing to saints. And so that applies to saints. My wife shared the scripture in Ephesians about esteeming others better than yourself with someone. And the person responded, I don't believe that doctrine. <laughs> I'm like, that's convenient. <laughs> that's very convenient. I don't believe that, so I don't have to do it. And I'm like, well, that's kind of what that verse right there says. And again, you could say, well, that was to the Philippians. No, he's writing to the church. So we have to discern this difference here, people. We're to love one another. All through the scriptures, he called believers to love one another. To me, these things are written to the church, and therefore they are timeless. And yes, we have to, there's time statements. We've got to figure out what's going on there. There's certain things that apply only to them because he's dealing with a situation in their age. But again, these letters are written to the church, and we are the church. And so we have to, you know, I just, I think it's ludicrous that people are saying, well, the Bible's none of it's to us, none of it applies, none of it has anything to do with it. Well, then why are you even bothering? Go on. Why are you even talking about it? Why do you go put messages out on YouTube talking about how none of it applies to us? Why do you care? What matters? Listen, there's much in the New Testament that doesn't apply to us because we don't live in the transition period. Our text for today is case in point. You talk about spiritual gifts. Well, that was a, for them. I don't believe that they're available today. I don't believe they're needed today. The body is complete. If we understand the transition period, we understand that we live in the age to come. And many of the things of the transition, don't, they don't apply. Only when we know what time it is will the Bible be relevant to us. We'll be able to understand certain things. We're not looking for things we already have, okay? Or trying to hold on to things that are past. Listen, we're not living in a day of hope. As believers, we live in a day of have. God has moved into the body of Christ. The body was complete, the house was finished, it was built, and God moved in. He doesn't dwell in buildings, He dwells in us. We are sacred space. I think understanding this is, you know, I remember as a futurist, and you know, you read Revelation, and you'd say, oh, God's going to, He's going to dwell with His people. Won't that be so good? Well, hello. 
Why not enjoy it right now? Because it's here. He dwells with us. He's here 24-7. He's not in a temple locked away. We have to take a sacrifice and try to go there. We're sacred space. God dwells with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for your word. Lord, please give us the heart of Bereans. May we take the things we hear and filter them through the scripture. May we be diligent to take what we hear and examine it and see if it is so. Lord, help us not to be critical people, but critical thinkers that evaluate the things we hear according to the word of God. Father, I thank you for the privilege we have to have the Word of God so readily available to us today. May we know it. May we be familiar with it. So when we hear a teaching, we automatically know if it lines up with Scripture or not. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace to us. Amen. I had, a, I had a person say to me once, if there's no more spiritual gifts today and you don't have the gift of teaching, then why do we need you? <laughs> I said, you don't. Just study for yourself, okay? <laughs> That's the whole thing. We, you know, people just think there's something miraculous out there. And you know, if you thought I had the gift of teaching and it was supernatural, then you know, haven't been paying attention. Any questions, comments? Is there something to say? I, I believe that the gift, well, pastor, elder, bishop, you know, those are synonymous terms in Scripture, okay? So we have elders here. Jeff and I are elders in this body, okay? Um, and we are to be caring for the flock, helping the flock. Now, I think, boy, you can get in a situation where some of these guys overlord and try to dictate every, I mean, I've had pastors tell people, you're not allowed to have fellowship with these people. You can't do this, you can't, no, I don't think it was ever intended to be that way. You know, I think that we're here to teach and to encourage. I really believe if you attend a place where the Bible is taught, most of the needs of counseling even go away, you know, because you're taught the word of God. Okay, that's what, what's supposed to happen. But somehow today we've gotten away from teaching. And, and we just, you know, it's three points in a poem. It's build you up, encourage you, and send you out. And that doesn't sustain you, you know. Uh, you need the Word of God. I think they wrote the letters in letter form. So let's just go through them in letter form and see what we can learn from them. So. <laughs> Churches where you sit there and you hear this message and it's like, what are they trying to tell us? You walk away more discouraged than before. Mm -hmm. Or you walk away five minutes happy and you're right back to yourself again. Yeah. <laughs> well, emotionalism doesn't, you know, doesn't sustain you very long. I got a question here. If the lamb was taken on the tent and slain on the 14th, if Christ is the antitype, wasn't he taken on the tent and examined three days and found to be without spot or blemish and slain on the 14th? Yes, he was. And they examined him. You know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they called him in. They examined Christ and they found him to be blameless and they executed him. So... Yes, the type, the anti-type, and, and an anti-type and type don't have to fit in every little detail, okay? But if you look at the two, two Exodus periods and you see the difference, you see the miraculous is there and then the miraculous fades out, I think, you know, I think we learn a lot from that. But like I said, most people don't, have never heard of a transition period, they don't understand that, and I think it's a big detriment because you end up, again, not knowing what time it is, and if you don't know what time it is, you don't know what's yours and what's not yours. Gary? Do you uh, harp on the transition period here? I think most people haven't heard of the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, that's probably true also. Most people haven't heard of that. And if, when they do hear about it, they go, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> I mean, really, they don't understand. How does that being destroyed have anything to... They don't understand the covenantal ties. You know, God shutting down the old covenant. They just don't... It's not taught. History is not taught. 
you know those things are and some people who do know about it they just that you know they blow it off as that can't be you know that can't be what the Lord said it was to do with spiritual yeah. yeah they don't connect it so if, as you might put it teachers and counselors and elders and stuff like that if you know even for the first time that introduced to something new that you've been taught that day that gives you an insight wow I didn't know that let me continue to study this if they don't continue don't to teach the truth or whatever will that change which is good for him and his congregation then what you think might happen to him if he well I know you're not God and all this stuff but you know that <laughs> my but, wife tell you but but, <laughs> but you know you think they'll be uh what's that what I'm trying to use for that blame for that you know, or I know it's hard for you to answer that the Bible but, says be not many teachers for you will receive the stricter judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, James talks to us about, about that. So I, I think that's important. I think when you stand up before a group and claim to be a teacher, there will be, you know, judgment for what you're doing. I'm not mean eternally, you know, but we're talking about the reward platform of the Lord and being held accountable for that. And, you know, there's just, the church today, I think, just in my opinion, is so far off from biblical that it's, it's not even recognizable you know it's just a big production today you know with lights and smoke and everything else you know going on that it's it's just sad the church is to be it is the body of Christ where you know we come together for teaching and then we scatter to evangelize it but you know as a body we're to be involved in each other's lives help know each other pray for each other encourage each other you know, the one and others of Scripture are mm -hmm. tremendous, you know. All right, somebody's asking a question. What is the type of the transitional period? The Exodus was the type. The transition period is the antitype. They're both 40 years. Miracles happen both periods. 